Hi, I'm Lori Adams, and the April What's Neat starts right now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is What's Neat for April 2018. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we've got a really full show. First of all, our friend Jason Quinn comes by, and this month he shows us how to remove lettering off of factory painted locomotives so that we can easily change the locomotive numbers on our models. Now we visit John Parker's BNSF Fall River Division layout. This is a prototype based layout. It's an absolute masterpiece to see this month on What's Neat. Also Kevin Rubel shows us a little bit about CAD Rail, a layout design program, and he shows us how to get the free download so we can experiment with it ourselves. Now we discuss the right types of glues to use on the sides of your grills on locomotives in the event that they pop off. We talk about the right and the wrong kind of glues to use for this. Stephen M. Conroy shares with us some gorgeous drone footage this month, more Southern California eye candy in modeling ideas from above, and lastly we cover the BTS sawmill project that I've been working on. We've got an update on this this month that goes into the construction of wrapping the wood around the scene and carving out the log mill pond. Now I want to thank Caboose, that wonderful train store in Lakewood, Colorado, that's the exclusive sponsor for the What's Neat show, and they They've got a gorgeous new website that's got over 142,000 model railroad items that you can purchase and have shipped directly to your home. So check it out. It's at mycaboose.com and they've given us an ex a spot on the website where they talk about the What's Neat show and they've given us a really good location where you can click on it and see all of the What's Neat shows. So with that, that's the lineup for this April 2018 What's Neat. For layout construction this month, we continue on with the BTS sawmill project. Last month, we laid the track around the BTS sawmill area and successfully ran the first train around the reverse loop. This month, I pick it up with the planning of the access roads and the six points where the roads will cross the track into the scene. After plotting out the railroad crossings, I filled the track area where the crossings will go with wood glue and proceeded to line up HO scale wood railroad ties, three rows between the rails and two rows outside the rails forming the road deck. I sanded the railroad crossing wood flush with the tops of the rail using an oscillating sander. I then cleaned out the flangeways with a standard hacksaw blade that has been cut down to about six inches in length. This provides the perfect width for flangeway clearance for our models. Using a fine toothed miter saw, I cut the ends of the ties forming the outside of the road, which will be a 22 foot wide crossing deck. This will be stained with wood stain and gray weathering chalks, with the road slash dirt brushed up to the sides of the ties flush, forming a smooth crossing for our vehicles and horse-drawn wagons. Turning my attention to the outside edges of the diorama, I wanted to form a perfect curve around the peninsula, with about two inches of space around the outside edge of the track, just in case of a rollover accident. 
I needed to add foam to the outside edges of the layout, so I started this process by cutting and squaring the sides of the peninsula, making a flat surface, which would eventually accept two inch sections of foam cut to match the six inch thick edges of the seam. I used polyurethane Gorilla Glue wet with water to glue the foam to the sides of the layout. And I held this into place with six inch long large pan head screws. While the glue cured over a period of 30 minutes, these screws held things into place. I continued this process till I had an even distance between the track and the edge of the layout of about two inches all the way around the entire scene. I then drew a line atop the foam in the curved arc of the shape of the layout and I followed this line up with a pruning saw, cutting up and down, squaring the sides. I then further smoothed the sides of the layout using a handheld planer, a Stanley Shoreform planer and a metal square, checking my work very carefully all the way around as the squareness and the roundness will be very important when it's time to wrap wood sides around this diorama. So I've got the entire BTS sawmill complex laid out here on the table. It comes in a rather large box, but there's something extremely important that I need to do because this structure is built so that it actually steps off into the water. Now what do I mean by that? Part of the structure sits on very short piers and then the part of the structure that extends over the water sits on larger piers. And the way I'm going to design this and model this, I'm going to have to build it so that I have the depth of the water already preconceived in my mind as I'm putting this together so that the building will simply fit into position and then set right on top of the water. Now in order to do this, first I've got the diorama all laid out here and you can see clearly where I'm going to put the water. I've got a router set up here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this router and I'm going to router out the absolute depth of where the surface of the water is going to meet the building and able to arrive at that dimension by studying these smaller parts right here that in fact are the piers for the building. These are the longer parts that will step off into the water. These are the shorter parts where the structure is actually going to sit on the land. Now you can see I've got the building sort of laid in its position here where I think it's going to go but I've got movement of about a half an inch either which way at this point until I get final positioning figured out. Now what I'm going to do is take the router and set it for the depth of the absolute difference between the shorter piers and the longer piers which comes out to be just under three quarters of an inch or about 11 sixteenths of an inch if I did my math correctly on this. So what I'm going to do now is set the router for 11 sixteenths of an inch and simply route out the log pond so that I can then finish the top of the water when I get to that point but that'll ensure as I build the structure it'll set right down into position into the seam. So that's the next step at this point. Using a three quarter inch wide straight router bit, along with a vacuum cleaner, I slowly cut the log mill sorting pond out of the foam to the depth which will represent the water's surface. I made a crisscross pattern in the foam with the router until the uncut foam pieces were small enough to break off and vacuum up to clean the area flat. I followed this up with a flat Chinese pole saw, cleaning the remaining uncut rough chunks of foam out of the pond. I further finished the pond's banks and topography with my Stanley Shoreform Planer, just rubbing and smoothing the topography along the side of the bank. I carved the track's profile and the ballast lines with a bent horse rasp, working my way around the track sides. I sanded the flat water surface with 50 grit sandpaper, smooth and level. Then I hand sanded the area with 150 grit sandpaper, paying close attention to the areas where the water will meet the bank. I carefully assembled the sawmill's foundation together with wood glue and a lot of square blocks, ensuring a perfectly square foundation. 
I also assembled the structure's main walls using the same process. Using a soldering iron, I drilled or melted holes where the building's piers will set into the foam. Now if all of my math was correct, the building will fit square to the tracks, fitting perfect into the pond's bank, and the layout piers sitting atop the water's surface. I love it when a plan goes together. I assembled the walls of the powerhouse, the planing shed, the drying racks, and all of the other buildings that will fit into this complex, simply to understand their size and relation to placement in the diorama. I routed out a three-quarter inch groove along the outsides of the foam and filled this groove with blocks of wood secured in place with polyurethane adhesive. I then followed this up with wet one-quarter inch oak plywood stapled into the blocks in the foam and then glued to the foam surface. Following the round flow pattern of the diorama, it made for a very beautiful presentation. I contoured the tops and sanded everything smooth with fine sandpaper. I then stained the sides with red oak stain to match the rest of the woodwork in my studio. And after applying three coats of polyurethane, wet sanded in between coats, the sides of this section of the layout appeared to be complete. Now in a future update, we will add blocks to the sidings, finish the scenery, and finish the rest of the buildings and structures. And that ends this layout construction segment on What's Neat. For this segment of What's Neat, I've got something that's really neat. And that's the whole name of the show, right? I'm here with John Parker in his BNSF Empire. And believe you me, that's just what it is. This is a double mushroom layout with double layers, carpeting, lighting, digitracks. It's got everything that we've ever wanted all in one spot. I'm so excited I can't even hold this microphone steady. But let's let Let's let you tell us about your wonderful sure. environment that I'm standing in here. Please okay. tell the What's Neat folks. I don't even know what inspired you to build this. Thanks, Ken. Well, it's a, the layout's a, uh, a modern prototype freelance BNSF, uh, Aero's 2016. 16. And uh, this is my second large layout. And um, so it's, it's a multi-level layout, um, meaning it's a mushroom, so you only see one level at a time. Yes. And that's the whole concept and the idea. Um, it really maximizes the mainline run. Yes, shout out, I... shout out to Joe Fugate. He yeah. loves those mushroom designed layouts. And now I've seen one, Joe, and they make sense. They save a lot of space, don't they? they? Do. And Joe was a fantastic inspiration. Even um, I've got some of his original videotapes, and I've talked to Joe a few times, and I just love the concept. And uh, so that's what I've decided to implement here at, on the Fall River Division. I've seen it in drawings, but yeah. to actually walk into one, you right. can fit into it. Yeah. I wasn't really sure about the head height, yeah. but you must have very high ceilings on this basement. Yeah, I built the house with uh, nine and a half, ten foot ceilings. Okay. Um, so their duct work and everything else is above the, the uh, ceiling. And that's a requirement for a mushroom to be comfortable and to have enough headspace. Have now you use a Digitrack system and I imagine you probably operate this layout. Yes. How many folks does it take to work it? Uh, generally between 18 and 22 operators. Is there a special night during the week? Uh, Saturday, we usually operate the uh, second Saturday of each month. So we're all crashing his house on some Saturday. <laughs> Yes. But I You're mean, I see, I see the Digitrack system. I also see a closed camera circuit system where right. you can keep track of the trains, yes. including the loading system that I filmed right. with the coal yeah. so that you can see because you said you wanted to make sure there was no vagrants in those coal That's cars. Right. Yeah. I mean, who, who thinks of that? And then the lighting. We walk through the layout room. You turn off the, first of all, you've got great lighting and balances. That's number one. Everything's well seen. But when you turn off the lighting, you've got hundreds, you've got thousands of little lights. The grain elevator, all of these beautiful scenes that we're walking up, it's like far out. Yeah, all the finished scenery um, has LEDs. Uh, we do operate at night, so we've got night lighting for the you know, blue LEDs for the effect. And uh, everything is lit up. Um, we've got street lights, the buildings are lit up. Uh, 
everything's got a light on it. So. How old is this layout? You say you're modeling 2016. So right. did you start building this in 2014 thinking I'm going to do 16? The layout is about 10 years old now. Okay. So uh, my original era was 2005. And just within the last few months, we updated the era. Oh, to you're on one of those sliding right. scales yeah, right. that so, will continue to slide. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's cool. So the modern equipment is just so fantastic now it's available now. So we had to move up to 20. I want to start with how many feet of track, but how many feet of aisle space did I just walk? I got lost. Remember, you had to go find me. I've yeah. never gotten lost. Can you get lost in a train layout? I just got lost and he found me. Right. And how many feet of aisle space is there? Uh, I have no idea. That's a great question. It's, um, it's got to be a, more than 100, maybe 200? Well, there's more than 1,000 linear feet of mainline track. Okay. Um, so um, that gives you an idea of, of how much aisle space there is. 1,000 uh, feet of track. And how long does it take you to clean the track before the operating <laughs> session? Well, I've got a lot of great help. Okay. Uh, so uh, my friends love to come over and clean track before a session. So it's not too bad. Now, you've got passenger train operation and freight train operation. You've got coaling. Name us some of the industries that I just saw. Some of well, the types of industries. Right, we do have a coal mine. Uh, I think you saw the coal mine up on the second level. Um, and we actually have a power plant. So we have a, a job that goes between the power plant and the coal mine. We've got large grain facilities, um, some uh, branch line on a layout that has um, OSB plant, or roofing materials plant, uh, a lot of different large industries. So that's the focus is large industries with a lot of spots and a lot of work rather than smaller it's this is awesome. It's carpeted, it's comfortable, it's well laid out, it's a very good height. It appears you're just about 48 inches high 48, here. Between 48 and 50. And then your second level as we walked around, that was a different level, wasn't yeah, that's it? A few, that's about 12 inches higher. So it's uh, it's pretty close to you know, your neck level that provides just a great perspective. Another thing I've seen is you you painted your walls, but you also use a lot of photographic backdrops, right. and it seems like you've put them in such a perspective view that no matter where you view the layout, the background seems to blend in just right. Was that an accident, or did you plan it? No, that was the plan. Um, I started with the backdrop, painting backdrops, and then transitioned to the photo backdrops, but my, um, my approach was to be able to photograph and get that perspective uh, when you're standing trackside. And, uh, and that's, uh, it seems to work out very well. Now I see you've got some of your cohorts back here behind yes. us. Can we go talk to them? Sure. And let's find, out, let's find out what you guys think about this. You guys come and play here often, is that right? Yeah, we do. Tell yeah. me your name. Whit Carmen. Whit Carmen. Mike Carr. And Mike Carr. Guys, tell me about your experiences on this layout. Come a little closer here and tell <laughs> the guys, because you guys are actually the ones that get to play with it. He yeah. built it. He eats and sleeps it all night long. When you guys leave, you get to go home. You know, it's not with you. We don't want to. <laughs> but what's it like to operate on something like this? It's so complete and well oh, thought it's, out. It's great. It's, it's, there's never a boring job. Everything is fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a real dream to operate this. It. Uh, he's got something of everything. You like switching jobs? We got switching jobs. You like mainline runs? You like coal trains? You like yards? Mainline, whatever. John's got just about everything here that I can think of. So you got, what's your favorite part of the layout? What uh, really jumps out at you? Jeez, so much of it. I, it's, there, there are too many things that I you like. You have a favorite part? Mm, no, not really. As far as operating, I like to run the yard. The yard is fun. That'll keep you busy, won't it? All now, safe. I've noticed that all of your main lines, as you look at the main lines, every all, all of, everything's right. The topography seems right. You've really thought about that. Now, you've also got signaling on this layout, is that right? That's correct, yep. Yeah. Tell me about the signaling system that you use. Well, we use the uh, Digitrax components, the BLMA signals, and a friend of mine um, actually wrote the CTC program to represent um, a modern day CTC, CRT based CTC system. So, That's awesome. Yeah. This is fantastic. Now, let me ask you this. If any of the viewers out there want to contact you, have you got a website or a Facebook page that you like to use? Yep, I have a web page. It's uh, www.bnsfrr.net. And I'm also on Facebook under BNSF Fall River Division. Okay, this is a treat. I just want to go run some trains. So thank you for sharing this Thanks with the coming. viewers and guys. This is a treat. I I just don't want to leave. We're staying. <laughs> You're more than welcome to. <laughs> and that's this segment of What's Neat. Hey, 
I'm Jason Quinn, and on this segment of What's Neat, we're going to tackle one of the very common problems for people that have fleets of locomotives. The manufacturer only makes so many numbers, and as you can tell, I got a real problem for Chessy System SD40-2s, and I had to renumber several of these, and that's what we're going to show you right now. Okay. These are the items that you're going to need. This can either be done with solve set, which is what I use. This is more aggressive, or Microscale's Microsol. A lot of people use this too. And what basically what we're going to do is we're going to remove this number, 86 or 8267. is going to become 8272. So this is actually a very easy process. We're going to start off. Um, you're going to need to get a piece of paper towel cut to the exact size of the number that you're removing. If you do not do this, you will remove anything that your paper towel touches, which would be very bad. So, what we're going to do is we're going to lay this on here. I've already got this one cut to size, so you'd want to do whatever you're doing and cut it to size. I'm going to use the saw the set because this is what I like. Liberally soak your brush in saw the set. You might have to take a second, and eventually it'll grab a hold, and you're going to soak this. Being sure, once again, it only touches the number or data you're wanting to remove. And you'll know it's saturated because you'll see the number come through the paper towel. So this one's saturated here, and we're going to let this sit. I let them sit about 15 minutes, but that time is subject to change depending on what you're doing. And this technique doesn't work on all numbers, but it's easy enough to try that if it doesn't work, you're not going to hurt anything. But most everything I've done it on does work, but I've had a few instances where it doesn't, so I just want everybody to be aware of that. So basically what we're doing now is we're just going to let this sit for about 15 minutes and uh, we'll come back and show you the magic. Here we are 15 minutes later and we're going to remove this and you're going to see the magic. One thing I uh, would like to note is that during this process um, this needs to stay wet. It will dry out so you need to kind of babysit it and keep it wet. But um, this has already worked excellent on this one just pulling it up the four is, is or the six I guess it was is totally gone. So we're going to take scotch tape. I personally use the stuff that's in the green packaging and we're going to put this right over top of this like this. Pat it down. And peel it up. Just like that. And since this is a, a GE we're going to have to hit this area again right here because uh, um, there's a little bit left on it, but it, it'll come off real easy. So what I'm going to do there is I'm going to take my uh, paper towel that's still soaking wet and kind of just rub it a little bit on the area. And that little remaining area will come off. I'm going to dry it off. And uh, let's get a new piece of tape. Get in there for a fingernail. And pop that off there. Okay. That's pretty much it. There's a little bit remaining, but when you go to renumber it, like I did on this side here, um, you'll never notice it was ever there. So that's uh, how to remove numbers off of uh, manufacturer pre-painted cars. Hope this is helpful to you guys. Thanks. Uh, I'm Michael Richards, and you're watching with Sneet with Ken Patterson. <laughs>
Ahmed Dressel, and I'm gonna be dead nuts level with you. This is What's Neat. For this layout construction segment of What's Neat, I want to discuss planning your layout. Now, I've been doing this for years using a paper and pencil. I've had three years of architectural training in school, whereas I feel very comfortable with a T-square and a triangle on a nice piece of paper, whereas I can plan out the outside dimensions of my room and then take a compass and figure out drawing my radiuses where my peninsulas go and where I can fit the layout in the room. I feel very comfortable with a piece of paper and a pencil. It just works. But the other day, I was hanging out with Kevin Rubel. You'll know him as a proprietor of that wonderful train store in Lakewood, Colorado, known as Caboose. And he was showing me something that I was unfamiliar with at the time. Now, since talking to him, I got the free download version of CAD Rail, which is a layout planning software program for designing your layout. But Kevin's got years of experience in using it. And that night I was hanging out with him, he showed me sort of a little bit about it and how to get the free download for it. So I turned on the video camera and with that let's let Kevin Rubel take it up from here and explain to us about drawing your layout on a computer. What are you doing besides eating dinner here Kevin? It's not dinner. What are you doing here? I see you got the laptop out, you got all these microengineering number five turnouts laid out here on the table. Um, so you're designing something here. I told you I have to kill you. <laughs> so, whoops, I'm zooming in. Yes, I'm designing something. This is a track plan. Doesn't look like it right now. These are the, this is my bench work as it exists. As you know, I'm redesigning my layout for the second time. I just made a crazy line um, for the second time. And so we're fitting a piece of the Monon Railroad Southern Division north of Louisville to New Albany and Borden, Indiana into this same bench work that I have designed. Just seeing if it fits. And, and what, it fits. what program are you using there? This? Yes. Well, I'm glad you asked. This is CAD Rail. CAD Rail. I've not used any other CAD programs, but I can tell you this. I've used CAD Rail for probably about 15 years, and at least 15 years. And when I was CEO of Marquette Rail, I used this to do preliminary drawings for sites for new customers for industrial development. We'd sketch out their spurs with this with this program, and then their engineers would take it and make final engineering drawings from it. That's how good this program is. You should try it. That's amazing. Now, how do we get a program called CAD Rail to, to design our layouts? How do we, how do well, we go about doing we that? We go to sandiasoftware.com. Okay. And we check it out. I think, you know what? Do they offer a free version or something? Let's try that. Okay. Because I am so used to using pencil and paper, so and you know. say that this is better than pencil and paper. I think this is a website. Let's make sure it is. Oops. No, Kevin has to spell it correctly. Sandiasoftware.com. Okay, so this is CAD Rail 10.2. Yep. And uh, actually, this does 3D stuff too. I've never done that. Um, but they have um, here free demo. Right A free there. demo right here. There you go. That's my answer. You can always save up to 60 objects in your drawing. So you can't make a huge basement building layout with your free demo, but that's a pretty good deal, free demo. And then I'll tell you what, let's see. I'm trying to see here what kind of price point this software has. I don't remember right off the top of my head because I bought it, again, 15 years ago. But it's um, it has a great library. It has like a lot of the different Walters buildings, a lot of the different Atlas buildings, a microengineering track, Walters track, Atlas track, Pico track. It has a lot of the different um, um, things you can buy in different scales, by the way, in the library. It's already in here, so you don't have to um, do what I'm doing right now, which is to put these microengineering number five ladders in. I'm actually constructing figures um, for, these, for these switches, for this ladder. Anyway, pretty, pretty cool program, check it out.
for this segment of What's Neat, I'm sitting here replacing some of the metal screens that have actually popped off of my U50s here. Because one day I was running my U50s and I, I left my lift out section out and dropped them on the floor. And quickly they became kits. So after I found out mechanically they worked perfect and I got them to run again, I'm finally getting to the point where I'm actually putting in the screens. And I want to talk about this for a minute because as I was doing this, I realized that I've got a technique that may, may be a little bit unorthodox, but it works very well because it's inevitable. At some point, you'll have an F unit or you'll have some sort of a model where the screens are going to pop off of it and you want to reattach them back on. So what do a lot of people do? I've seen this over and over again. For example, here's an engine that came from a swap meet where somebody tried to repair the locomotive by using Wather's goo and reapplying the screens to the locomotive. And as you can see, it kind of doesn't really work out so well. I also see they tried super glue here on this end using one of these uh, super glues. And as you can see on this end here, it's inevitable it smokes up the glass, kind of messes up the model, and you see the shiny super glue through. So what's the solution? Well, what I've realized is contact cement, the same material that's used to apply the finish on top of tables, to put laminate on top of a table, is a relatively permanent cement. And at the same time, it always remains just a little flexible, just a little, not rubbery, but always flexible, which is perfect for the screens. Because as you know, these metal screens, they change temperature and they tend to pop off of a locomotive, especially if they're attached with super glue, which tends to be a little brittle. Here's an F unit that I just finished replacing the screen on this, and I use contact cement to do it. And I'm gonna explain to you how to do this because a little bit goes a very long way. When I glue down the rail to the layout here, the third rail for my narrow gauge, a lot of areas I kind of got lazy and didn't spike it, but after two years, it's still in place. So the glue is very permanent. It works beautifully well, and especially on the rail, again, changing of temperature, it's never popped off. And that's why it's good for these screens. So let me explain to you the process. First of all, I take the glue and I put it out on this anvil that I've got here. I use that as my surface, my work surface for the glue. And I use dental picks to apply the glue to the screen work. And I spin the pick around, and this glue is kind of stringy sometimes. You can use that stringiness to your benefit. It's almost like snapping a line on the computer, whereas you can apply the string right where you want the edge of the screen to have the glue attached to it. But anyway, you work the glue onto the screen and then you put the screen into place and it just fits perfectly. If you get a little bit on the edge, it's no big deal. This glue rubs right off while it's still wet. And if, as long as you don't get it inside any of the screen work, it works perfect, it remains flexible, and allows your screens on your locomotives to remain attached no matter what the temperature change that the model experiences. So it's just a suggestion, something to think about if you're reattaching the screens to an old locomotive, something you get from a swap meet or something you dropped on the floor. If you've got to do it, contact cement appears to be the best type of glue to use just for this. And that's this building tip for models on what's neat. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado, or order online at mycaboose.com.